And well, thank you so much for joining me. First, see if we could talk about the title. I won't fear tumbling or falling if we'll be joined in another world. Where did that come from? Yeah, so I was just at this Airbnb and there was a book of, um, it was like a book of Japanese poetry. And so I was looking through it and I was thinking about what to title the show. And I had, I knew I wanted to have it be some sort of snippet of text from something. And so I was playing around with a few different title ideas. And then I came across this line from this poem and I thought it was so kind of, I don't know, it hit the right tone for me because all my titles that I was coming up with were a little more on the pessimistic side. And so I, I think I kind of wanted to have something that maybe kind of struck that sense of things being completely turned upside down, but maybe, uh, you know, potential for it turning out a bit better <laughs> because yeah. things were not necessarily so great to begin with. I think that's why things were able to topple so quickly. It's, I guess what, what drew me to that, that line of poetry was this sort of, um, this sort of uncontrollability and this unknown quality that I think I try to achieve in my paintings as well. And just that I observed in this sort of ongoing state of being. But, uh, but it's also the state that is within that lack of control and the chaos of it. There is a lot of agency and there's a lot of potential for being, uh, being an active agent within a lot of chaotic surroundings and things that are out of your control. I mean, often with the paintings, there's this sort of wild contortion of the figures, but then they're also, I mean, they, they're both kind of being held in these crazy positions and then being sort of active to move within the confines uh -huh. of the canvas. So it always is this, this uh, both and situation. I understand that the paintings were made during lockdown. How was lockdown for you? And to what extent is that experience reflected in the paintings? Yeah, I mean, all the works were made, uh, yeah, really within like the last five months or so. So all in the midst of the pandemic and then Black Lives Matter and the fires in California, which I feel like point to this larger issue of global warming um, and so and climate change. So there's been sort of a lot of factors influencing my psyche, I guess, in the creation of these works. And then on top of that, this very strange sort of sense of being both very connected to all these major issues that have like I said before, we're sort of bubbling below the surface and now you can't ignore them. Um, and then combined with the actual strange reality of just being in my home and with my home studio behind my house. And so on the one hand, it's like everything is more chaotic feeling than ever before. And then on the other hand, it's like, I, you know, in 2019, I was tra I traveled to China. I traveled to Europe many times. I was in like all over the United States. I, I did so much travel and this year I'm like just home <laughs> and like not really moving that much. So it's this, um, this strange combination of feeling like I'm physically very still, but I'm mentally like things seem like they're moving faster than ever before. And so I really channeled a lot of that into the new paintings. And so it's this um, I, I would say like one of the biggest differences in these new works is in the past, a lot of the environmental features and like the planes that interact with the figures tended to, to they would, they would usually focus more on um, these sort of complex patterns that I would find just through moving through a daily routine of you know, going to the store and rummaging through thrift stores and seeing things on when I'm driving around town and like interesting hand painted signs around LA. But being more still and then being on the computer in tandem has led me to really notice these shifts in light. So I would say these new works have much more of an emphasis on these sort of gradients of light that, inter that interact with the figures. And mm -hmm. I've just been interested in this sort of subtle shift of like a very negligible change of season that happens in Southern California, but you do notice slight differences. And so it's been this sort of strange, gradual shifting light in LA and then the sort of bombardment of this projected digital light of my phone and my computer. So yeah. I think the new works really kind of, I don't know, they, they are holding on to that sort of slow, fast contrast of, 
uh, physically still world and then a this mental chaos. You've talked quite a lot about the heightened sense of disembodiment during lockdown as a result of COVID. And I wondered if you could say a bit more about this. So much of my work is about this, these moments of intimacy and these uh, interpersonal experiences that lead us to having a better understanding of who we are and sort of can point out sometimes the expanding gap between how we see ourselves and how other people see us um, or this longing to be seen the way that we see other people. So something that I talk about a lot in my work is how like if I'm having a face-to-face -face interaction with somebody in person, like, you know, back in the day <laughs> before this year, but like if we were to be meeting in person, I would be seeing you and I would see you in your face and I would probably be, you know, similar to the Zoom call, I would just be looking kind of at your like, you know, shoulder up <laughs> perspective of yourself. And I would see you as this, uh, this very coherent person also because I would only know you in relation to our interaction. So I know you uh, as somebody interviewing me and I would know you like just in this context, how you present yourself yeah. to me. But for myself, I would see myself kind of in all the varied ways that I've been throughout the day and the week and the year and throughout my life. And, and so I see myself in this timeline that kind of seen myself in all these different, uh, like, you know, occupying all these different positions in relation to other people. And then I'm also, when I'm talking to you and I'm seeing your face, it's like, I'm this sort of, I can't see my own face. I'm just like weird, like jumble of limbs and parts. And it all leads up to me feeling all right, and I say me, meaning like any one of us in these interactions, we have this sense of fragmentation for ourselves in the face of these seemingly coherent whole other people. And so that's something that is a, it's, a, it's how we've adapted to having these sort of interpersonal exchanges. And it's this striving, I think, to, to find this coherence while feeling fragmented. And having the other person also having that exact same experience with you, because like, as crazy as I feel like I'm like, oh, well, I must seem kind of coherent to the other person because they can see me as a face and like, they're having that same set of experiences. And so there's something in there that I think with the exchange kind of leads to this third thing that's beyond or more than the sum of the parts of the experience. And so lately though, we've been sort of unable to do that because we've been on zoom calls so right now it's like yeah i can see my hands flailing around and stuff so i have that sense of fragmentation but i can also look up and i can see my face and it's the same as your face it's like there's this weird equal playing field with um i don't know with with being these flattened images and so it's this strange thing where, where we sort of have become more flattened in relationship to another person and so it, it kind of gets rid of that that experiential like gap, which yeah. though somehow like leads to, I think a greater sense of disembodiment because we're sort of losing that in time realization of ourselves that happens in the face of another person. Um, and then when we're in public, you know, if we're wearing masks and trying to like keep our hands sanitized and not touch anything, it's like yeah. there is then the sort of equal playing field of flattening that happens now in the, in, or like a fragmentation that happens when we're in public. So I don't know, I think it's just, it's been an interesting time to sort of experience the things that we maybe don't think about as often in a typical exchange because now we can't have a typical exchange. Yeah. I mean, if all that an interpersonal exchange with another person was, was just talking to them and seeing their face, then this should be enough. But somehow it's not enough, you know, yeah. like. I wanted to ask you about the use of the different patternings. It seems to sometimes kind of melt into some of the forms. And I wondered, it made me feel like echoes of painters like we are or Bonar but I wondered if that was completely far-fetched no no I mean <laughs> I mean I still have some patterning in this body of work and in the past I've continued to be interested in patterns in the paintings as I mean I really see them as being these uh these anchors for the figures that can sometimes be more there's moments with the with the figuration where there's areas of maybe just like a contour line and it's raw canvas on the inside and the outside of the form. Mm -hmm. And so in order to, to give this sense of that being like a solid decision, I have these patterned planes that come in that can be these 
very, I don't know, what, what I love about patterns is that they are something that could be so immediately recognized um, in a very simple way. Like they kind of give the sense of stability. And I don't know, I mean, like I, I'll oftentimes just look for patterns, again, just like in my daily routine. And so lately it's been sort of like a very domestic uh, mixed with sort of like an indoor outdoor living experience in LA. So there's like a lot more, uh, well, there's always flowers in my painting. So <laughs> I'm gonna say there's more flowers, but there's always a lot of flowers. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I used to actually put language in the paintings, uh, like actually just like write out phrases in them. Uh -huh. And I really, I love the way that that was an anchoring device and it could be this, this sort of stand in this very flat uh, stand in for something that you had to complete in your own memory or your own mind. So like, you know, if you have like a little snippet of text, um, similar to how I title the works, like mm -hmm. it's something that can evoke a feeling, but you really have to tie your own like meaning to it, or maybe you like know the song lyric that I'm referencing, or you know the pattern that I'm referencing. And so I just, I love the way that language can, can sort of anchor something to multiple locations. But mm -hmm. I found that the language, when I actually wrote it out in the paintings was too, I don't know, it's like too much of like a caption for the figures. And I, I never saw it as being a solid explanation for the figuration or for like a narrative going on in the work. And so I wanted to take out the language and see what would happen if I tried doing that with a purely visual device. And so the patterns really started to be developed as the substitute for language. Um, because, yeah, because I find that they have that sort of similar ability to be like, especially like with a, a bunch of like a pattern of flowers like that's something that we're so familiar seeing in like a tablecloth or a bedspread or a wall paper motif or then you could also kind of imagine as like a stylized field of flowers or flowers that are like resting on a pond or on a lake and so i love the way that it kind of can be in the natural world but then also really like in like a highly like domestic or manufactured world <laughs> as well. You, you did mention about the fragmentation of the body and there's these limbs entwining. I wondered if the bodies are expressing your lived experience or if they're drawn from people that you know or see or, or whether they're meant to express selves, different identities. Yeah, I well, I, I would say that the paintings on the whole, what I'm trying to arrive at is something that I will use oftentimes my own lived experience as uh, sort of like a template for <laughs> try to, trying to think through different, different larger ideas that I find that it's this weird thing where the more sort of specific I get to my own experience, weirdly, the more I find that other people connect with that same experience. My, my goal is to make work that can reflect this, this sense of being within your own skin and, and moving through the world and really, I mean, I'll oftentimes describe them as being portraits, not of looking at a body, but portraits of living within your own body, looking out at the world. And so I, you know, I draw my own experiences as, as a woman and as a queer person and as a person of color who has, I have a white mom and a black dad, but mm -hmm. I often look white to white people, but I connect with this kind of broader understanding and, and sensitivity to race existing on a spectrum that's found more in black communities. So, but I, I don't identify with, you know, being seen as black by white Americans, which is a big part of black identity uh, throughout all time. Um, and, you know, now just as much as ever. And so it's these sort of these, these complicated shifting senses of myself in different contexts that uh, I try to arrive at with the work. And so oftentimes the figures, I mean, I, I really see the figures in the paintings as, you know, only existing within that painting. So they don't, it's not like they have names or birthdays or anything like that, but they, they come from a, a long history of figure drawing. So like, I even still in quarantine was doing this like small little group, like this like little queer figure drawing group where we would like get together and take turns drawing each other. Um, we would all be like six feet apart 
and we take turns modeling. And it's so funny because we'd be like completely nude, but like wearing a mask. <laughs> I think I think that's really fascinating. And I love the idea of you all drawing in your yard. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> it's like somehow like very obscene. Um, but yeah, so like, but I, I always love drawing from the figure because it's this opportunity to sort of see the body doing things that are, it's always stranger than what I could imagine. And so I, I still really rely on observing other bodies. But the great thing about figure drawing classes is that you get to work with so many different ages and body sizes and genders. And so I'm often remembering body parts that I've seen when I'm creating the figure. And so it's not, they're never really tied to like one gender. Cause I'm usually like, oh, that like weird kind of knobby elbow that I saw in that like older looking like male presenting model. And then that sort of like fatter forearm that I saw in that like 20 something like female presenting model. So I'll, like I'll move between the models that I've seen mm -hmm. while ultimately trying to get at this sense of of being these multiple iterations of yourself and these sort of simultaneous contradictory states and and sometimes it's it's interacting with other people that makes that clear and sometimes it's interacting with your own memories of yourself or your own reflections of yourself so the paintings will kind of go back and forth between being these sort of multiple figures interacting and then being a single figure maybe interacting with like a shadow or movement or reflection. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I guess what I would say, like, I don't know, I feel like all my answers are like, yeah, it's both, <laughs> it's both and, but it always is with me. I mean, that's what I, that's what I love about painting and visual media is that you can express multiple ideas all at once and it can create this sort of visual harmony rather than uh, just being needlessly confusing. It can actually create like beauty out of confusion um because i have tried to do like my my undergrad work i i majored in philosophy and i tried to write out all these ideas and i found like as much as i love language like in a poetic form like language in a theory form i found to be a very difficult linear medium and painting is one where i can kind of have all of these conflicting and contradictory ideas all at once on the canvas to kind of get to this I don't know, this feeling that at least I feel when I'm in my own skin. I had my first experience with being a model. I mean, I've been doing figure drawing since I was 12, but wow. I, uh, I've i never been a model <laughs> before in it. So it was like, I was always really intimidated by the thought of standing still for that long. Mm -hmm. Like being nude is like not a big deal for me, but being still is. And so I was like really intimidated, but um, but it was really, it was really incredible to see the drawings that people did of me because I find that oftentimes like photographs can be a little jarring because I'm like, oh, is that what I look like? That's so weird. That's not what I feel like. Yeah. Um, but the the drawings of me were really accurate for what I felt like. <laughs> I was like, oh wow, you guys really like you even got like how like one side of my face felt like hotter than the other side. <laughs> like it was really incredible. Um, yeah. Which was like, I mean, I, in one of my figure drawing teachers, when I was younger, that was really influential for me. He was, he, he really emphasized that you should try to draw the figure while imagining what the pose would be like to hold. So, you know, if like a model is like leaning all of her weight on one side mm -hmm. and then the other side, like her arms are sort of like I don't know, flopped over. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm not a model. <laughs> but like, and so like, he was like, but imagine like the strain that would need to be put, that need to be like put on the, the foot and the leg that's holding all the body weight. And, you know, try to emphasize that idea of strain mm -hmm. uh, and difficulty in drawing the muscles of like the side of the body that's doing that. And then try to draw the ease that's happening in the body that's not supporting any of the weight. And so I think that sort of getting into the physicality of like holding a pose even before I ever held one myself is something that uh, really stuck with me with making the paintings and really trying to get at that like that the feeling of how to render discomfort and how to render ease in the figure and how you would shift your way of painting 
you know, it's it, it, areas of, of race and gender and sexuality are really more about the, the compositions and the ways that the bodies are, um, you know, contained by the frame and fragmented by the planes, uh, but also, you know, this, this push and pull between, uh, between either being sort of confined or having agency within that confinement is mm -hmm. really where I see uh, my experience of race and gender sexuality more so than in skin color or like a boob or something. Like <laughs> that I feel like is all sort of to describe weight and heat and things like that are done through color and body parts in my work and oh. and anything actually having to deal with identity I find much more in the compositions and the um these sort of yeah compositional and structural devices in the work that's so interesting I was wondering about the function of the boobs and the butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's I mean it can definitely be the sort of playful like um eroticism uh, with one read but I, I always see it as sort of being more kind of complicated than that because I mean I, I just I, I think that boobs are just fun to draw <laughs> but also just because there's this as somebody that like has them it's like such a there's so much kind of odd weight and like but you know I mean I work with a lot of queer models and you know I'm in a queer community so I don't necessarily see boobs as being tied to any one gender. Um, also, then when you expand it to having different body sizes too, you can have somebody that, you know, is identifies as being like cisgender male, but is like, you know, really fat and has boobs, you know? And so like, I think that when you start working with like a lot of different ages and um, body types and genders and in queer communities and stuff it suddenly it's like a little less cut and dry like what like what a woman's body is you know um and so yeah so it's really more to kind of play with like the fleshiness of the body um and so like I also like I love painting like rib cages also because I love like the boniness of a rib cage uh -huh. so there's like ribs just as much as there's boobs in the work <laughs> anything having to do with with this notion of yourself or like this notion of identity, mm -hmm. I feel like is very different than your understanding of like, or not very different, but it can be different mm -hmm. from like the, like, I don't know, the physicality of your boob. <laughs> it's not like the totality of like your experience as somebody that's gendered as like a woman, you know. The two paintings lay your burden down and they'll cut us down again have a suggestion of anger and violence to me at least and it felt like in they'll cut us down again there's this sort of sense of a violent thrusting force over to the left like the figure being hurled but it felt given the time that you were painting those I felt there were potential references to the horrific murder of George Floyd in that aggression. One of the things that I I'm always fascinated by is the sort of multifaceted nature of something like intimacy, which plays such a big role in my work and mm -hmm. something that I think about often. And so I'll often think about the, just the high level of intimacy that occur, that occurs in moments of violence and moments of extreme violence and how that's such an, an intimate experience. And then uh, also with mourning or with death and how grief and all of these sort of these moments that tie us to these very embodied states are these moments of intimacy. Mm -hmm. And so I think often we can kind of oversimplify intimacy and think of it just as being like about, you know, like love and embrace and friendship and sex and I don't know, having kids and like these, these moments of more sort of like cheerful intimacy, I guess. Um, and, but I think that there's intimacy really in any of these fully embodied experiences of like hunger, sickness. And so I think throughout this year, there's been so many instances of, you know, on the one hand, like what we were talking about, having this lack of intimacy in the more pleasurable forms, but also this, this sort of fear or this observation of these more horrific forms of intimacy in the forms of, um, you know, people dying, whether it's from COVID or from poverty, that's, exacerbated by COVID or from, you know, police brutality and all the violence with 
uh, with racism, <laughs> basically. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that the work definitely, there's some pieces that I've made before these works uh, that are in the show that I was making exactly at like the time of George Floyd's murder mm -hmm. and those pieces too. I mean, I, it really does seep into the work, this sort of, I don't know, this sort of lack of, uh, it's weird because I, I tend to feel fairly optimistic about art being really important and like the like a really valuable thing to do but with George Floyd's murder it really was this moment of like I don't know it, it, it took me a lot longer to sort of get back on the the horse with like <laughs> wanting to paint again because it felt like that was just such a horrific moment um and one where it just felt so like yeah it was this sort of too much moment like I have to do some things in addition to painting because uh you know art is amazing but it's not it's not everything <laughs> you need to do other things too you mentioned you don't make drawings um you don't make sketches for your work so you just go straight onto the canvas which is a bold thing <laughs> <I don't> think... <laughs> yeah it's, it's funny because it's like I, I think on the one hand you could see not having a sketch beforehand as being intimidating or nerve-wracking but I'm always like oh it's great because I can never mess up because it's like <laughs> I'm not trying to make it look like anything I'm just trying to move forward with the piece and so in that regard there's actually a lot of freedom when I first started painting because um because it's not trying to be anything it's really it's that idea again of of having some immediate intention when laying down uh marks and gestures but ultimately really responding to what actually happens and making new plans based on that. So it's kind of this process of always sort of, I had somebody in grad school once say this, and it's really true where you just are kind of always talking to yourself about your own painting. Like you're like constantly re-narrating what's happening to yourself and the story's changing as you go along. And so for me, I'll, well, so I do do a lot of preparatory sketches in the sense that I do a lot of, uh, observational drawing with figure drawing. Mm -hmm. And that sort of practices this, I see it as like this muscle memory of drawing the figure. And so mm -hmm. it makes me more familiar with just the gestures that my hands and arm would do in drawing the figure. So that when I approach the canvas, it's not that I'm drawing the figure, but it's that my hands have been like kind of used to drawing certain lines over and over again. And so I will really approach the canvas with, uh, I don't know sometimes I will have an idea but it like will never happen so I just kind of it's like not even worth pretending like I have a preset idea of what the canvas is going to be because it always changes but I I usually approach it with a very gestural and kind of all over the surface um approach and so I will I will lay down different gestural marks with different brushes and and then I will slow down my process by spending a lot of time just looking at the canvas. And so I think that part of, I was talking with like a group of high school kids uh, earlier this week, no, today's Monday, last week. <laughs> um, and we were talking about like, I was just talking to them about how you can get a lot from doing observational drawing in life, but then also when you're making your own work, you're also observing your own work. And so for me, a lot of time is spent just kind of observing what marks I've laid down and kind of, it's sort of like when you daydream looking at clouds or cracks in a wall, you know? So it's really finding images from this abstraction that I've laid down on the canvas and challenging myself to, even if I've laid down certain fragmented marks where I'm like, I bet this is gonna be a reclining figure. And then I'll like look at it and be like, no, it would be more interesting and unexpected for me to make that into like a seated figure here. And then that, those are like legs going into like another figure that I'm gonna complete. So that's this process really of like looking at my sort of abstracted gestural mark making and having the figures come out. And then from there, I will photograph the work and bring it into the computer. And then I kind of, so I'll start sketching halfway through the painting. So once the figures kind of start to emerge, 
and get more developed, I photograph the work, bring it into the computer. And then in Adobe Illustrator, I play around with the different like planes and gradients and patterns. And it's just another way for me to have that same sort of sense of anything's possible that happens when I approach a brand new blank canvas. Mm -hmm. um, while still allowing for large areas of the canvas to be blank <laughs> because uh, I can work some stuff out then digitally on the computer. Mm -hmm. And so, and sometimes all it's again, it's this process of, you know, having all these plans that then kind of get thrown out once I do the first one because it always leads to a new discovery. And so with the computer, sometimes I'll like, you know, I'll like, fill in an area just with like the track pad and it'll be like, oh, I'm just gonna fill this in with green. I know that I'm gonna paint it better later on. But then I get really attached to the digital mark and I'm like, actually that's a really cool digital mark. So then I'll perfectly mimic the digital mark back on the canvas. So there's a number of works in the show. There's like the, the rainbowy piece. Um, that one has like these, these uh, gray like rain sort of oh, yeah. uh, marks and then this uh, these sort of like uh, ripple puddle effects. And those are all just done kind of like on the track with the, with the computer. So that's like mimicked from a computer screen. Uh, yeah, so it'll be things that have worked out digitally. And then sometimes, I mean, everything's done in a very tactile hand done sort of way, but, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes I'll do it to really mimic that digital gesture rather than the hand gesture because one of the things that's so great about like the physical nature of painting is that I, I find that it's all sort of related to this like shoulder gesture of working. And so even when I change the scale of the canvases, the figures kind of are always in relation to the scale of my arm drawing them. And so, uh, and so adding the computer gesture is like a way of playing with a scale that's completely different. It's like this sort of, imagined scale because it's like the scale of a finger but blown up to be really big so um so yeah I, I use the computer and then it's and then from that point on it started this back and forth it's like the the easiest time is at the beginning when I don't know what it's going to be and then it's kind of like setting up all these problems that I need to solve yeah and that sort of this like <laughs> tricky thing and then I kind of I once I've sort of figured it all out that's kind of like coming through to the other side and um and then the painting is done. So it's, I mean, it's, it, I've been thinking a lot lately about how similar it is to this idea of an interpersonal exchange because it's really this, um, it's this back and forth between <laughs> what I think is gonna happen and what actually happens. And then it all sort of evolves into this third thing that's bigger than either of the two things. It's, it's like bigger than completely <laughs> invented on the spot or completely planned so oh, I think it's um it's quite yeah. hard to find to find when you're finished is it do you, do you no I mean I try to I try to put a bit of a time limit on myself with the paintings because I like to uh really I mean it can be easy for I think anyone an artist to get attached to certain things so I try to give myself a fairly short amount of time to work on a piece so I don't become attached to any part of it. Because sometimes there'll be something where I'm like, oh, that's like a beautiful face, but it's really distracting from the whole piece. So I need to actually make it really ugly or like add a bunch of really thick, weird paint on it. And I'd be too afraid to do that if I like was looking at the painting for months and right. I'd be like, oh, but it's so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, I really try to do things I, I look really hard and carefully at the work. So I spend a lot of time not painting, mm -hmm. but just looking. But then I also try to like not have anything take too long or else I get too attached to things that maybe aren't serving the greater image. Mm -hmm. uh, but I find that when a piece is done is usually when I spend a long time looking at a piece and can my eyes move around the piece and don't get too fixated on any one area. I usually find that's a good sign is when I'm sort of fixated by my own work. <laughs> I feel like that's always, you're like the first person that gets to test out your own painting, so.